year was 1977, and in the premise of NASA, humanity was gearing itself to test not only its limitations, but also the boundaries of the solar system. It was preparation for the paramount adventure, to go boldly where no man has gone before. With the launch of an unmanned mission, Voyager 1 and 2, humanity began its greatest journey ever. The uncrewed probes were not only about visiting all the planets of our system that were beyond our reach till then, but they would also travel past all the outer planets and venture into the great beyond outside our solar system. The Voyager mission fundamentally transformed our grasp of the solar system and how it came into being. But now, after so many years, that journey is coming to an end. With the two probes pretty much running on fumes, we're witnessing the end of an era of space exploration. Centuries from now, if humans make it out of our solar system, they will look back at these probes as the early precursor of their achievement. Welcome to Fact Nominal, and today on the eve of Voyager 1 and 2's lifetime coming to an end, we're going to look back at their incredible journey and what they've achieved for us. Serving human curiosity for 45 years, we have a lot of knowledge gathered to thank Voyager for. The two spacecraft not only helped us to understand the giant planets of our planetary system, but also discovered multiple moons over the years that include three new moons of Jupiter, four of Saturn, a whopping 11 orbiting Uranus, and six revolving around Neptune. The Voyager mission was also the first to spot rings around Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. The spacecraft discovered volcanoes away from Earth, lightning on Jupiter, and found evidence suggesting the presence of an extraterrestrial ocean at Europa, Jupiter's moon. It also found a nitrogen-rich atmosphere like ours on Saturn's moon, Titan. But that's not even half of what they've accomplished. After Voyager 1 departed from Saturn in November 1980, it began a journey to where no human-made object had ever gone before. By 2012, Voyager 1 had left the enormous magnetic bubble encompassing our sun, planets, and solar wind called the heliosphere and entered entirely new territory, the infinite space. Voyager 2 changed its course after departing from Neptune in August 1989 and also crossed the interstellar boundary in 2018. In their fading years, the two spacecraft are continuing to characterize the outer solar system environment and search for the heliopause boundary, the outer limits of the sun's magnetic field, and the outward flow of the solar wind. Penetration of the heliopause boundary between the solar wind and the interstellar medium will allow measurements to be made of the interstellar fields, particles, and waves unaffected by the solar wind and truly understand where the influence of our sun ends. By 2025, Voyager 1 will be about 13.8 billion miles, that's 22.1 billion kilometers from the Sun, and Voyager 2 will be 11.4 billion miles, or 18.4 billion kilometers away. Eventually, the Voyagers will reach other stars. 40,000 years from now, Voyager 1 will perhaps drift within 1.6 light years or 9.3 trillion miles of AC 793888, a star in the constellation of Camelopardalis, which is heading towards the constellation Ophiuchus. Around that time, Voyager 2 will pass 1.7 light years or 9.7 trillion miles from the star Ross 248. Around 300,000 years from now, Voyager 2 will pass 4.3 light years or 25 trillion miles from the brightest star in the sky today, Sirius. So even after they shut down, voyagers are fated to wander the Milky Way galaxy as a remnant of our civilization long after we might be gone. Interestingly, in 1990, on a special request from astronomer Carl Sagan, Voyager 1's sensors were flipped to take images of the Sun and, as he said, our pale blue dot. 
He remarked, looking at the image, how small and fragile our entire existence really is. From the wars of ancient civilization, our petty political grandstanding, the exploitation of the planet's ecosystem, and our entire evolutionary journey to the present day, it was all there in a tiny blue speck in a seemingly infinite black and indifferent universe. It's almost impossible to emphasize enough the impact of the Voyager missions on our progress in space exploration. They are the precursors and the principle that changed everything for all following missions and helped us chart what shape and direction all future human space exploration would take. At least for several decades, if not for centuries, these space probes will definitely hold the record for being the farthest traveling human-made objects out there. But the interstellar journey of the iconic probes is coming to a close after an exceptional and unexpected run of 45 years. Even as we're watching this video, NASA is continuing its slow shutdown of the two spacecraft systems to try to extend the probe's lifespans for a few more years, with a soft cutoff deadline set for 2030. Seven more years. Despite almost surviving 10 times their expected lifespans and venturing into vast, uncharted territories of our solar system, these bad boys are as hungry for knowledge as they were on their respective launch days. Physicist Ralph McNutt at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory joked, we've done 10 times the warranty on the darn things. He was a member of the plasma science team from before the launch, and today he's co-investigator on both the Voyager Low Energy Charged Particle and Plasma Science teams. But there's no doubt that the remarkable odyssey of these exceptional probes is finally winding down. In the past three years, NASA's had to shut down heaters and other non-essential components, conserving the spacecraft's remaining energy stores so they can extend their unprecedented journeys to about 2030. For the Voyager's scientists, many of whom have worked on the mission since its inception, like Ralph McNutt himself, it's a bittersweet time. The biggest challenge is to counter the decay of onboard power supplies, which is causing a reduction of their output by 4 watts per year. This has been the case since launch. However, now the power budget has reached a critical state, and the team has had to turn off whatever they can to keep the two spacecraft running and completing tasks. Both probes are powered with radioactive plutonium reactors, which have maintained a warm supply of power to the tiny onboard computers that have run for decades without a break. But every good thing must come to an end, and sadly, now the time has come for the Voyagers. Let's go back in time to the year 1965. The chilling rivalry between the Soviet Union and the United States of America could now be experienced from outer space as the two nations had begun the space race. Gary Flandro, a part-timer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, was tasked with an intriguing duty, finding the most efficient way to send a space probe to Jupiter, or perhaps even out to Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. America wanted to reach the gas giants before the communists could. Gary Flandro had no calculator or computer at his disposal, but with only a pencil, he made a discovery that would change the course of human history forever. While charting the orbital paths of those giant planets, he saw something extraordinary happening during the late 70s and early 80s. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all four behemoths of our planetary system, would line up like pearls strung up on a celestial necklace in a long arc with Earth. For us common people, it may not mean something more than just a cool once-in-a-lifetime spectacle, but for astronomers and NASA, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. A space vehicle could use the synchronization of these planets to get a speed boost from the gravitational pull of each giant planet as it passed, like being flung by a rubber band snapping at the last second, or what astronomers called gravity assist. 
This is the same technique that was used in the movie The Martian to bring Matt Damon's character home. According to Flandro's calculation, with the help of gravity assist, the flight time between Earth and Neptune could be reduced from 30 years to 12. There was only one teensy bit of a problem. This sort of golden hour opportunity would not happen again in the next 176 years. If NASA wanted to get the best out of such an opportunity, they had to launch the space mission by the mid-70s. Of course, with such a thread-needle sort of opportunity and challenge, NASA took no chance and would go on to prepare not one, but two space vehicles to cash in on such a rare occasion that wouldn't be available again till the mid-23rd century. The two space probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, were built identical in every detail, and in the summer of 77, NASA launched them within a gap of 15 days from Cape Canaveral, Florida. The Voyagers were originally designed only to conduct close-up studies of Jupiter and Saturn, Saturn's rings, and the larger moons of the two planets. Yup, it was supposed to be only a two-planet mission. In fact, nobody back then could have imagined these probes would spend nearly half a century in space and still keep sending data back home. The spacecraft were, in fact, built to last only five years. But both Voyagers surprised their makers with early success by accomplishing everything they were meant to do and still showing signs that they were hungry to keep pushing, striving for more knowledge. The additional flybys of the two outermost giant planets, Uranus and Neptune, seemed possible and tempting. The mission scientists and engineers at the Voyager's home could not resist. The team that pulled off the unthinkable back then was the brainchild of Bud Shermeyer, project manager of the Mariner Jupiter Saturn 1977 mission, the precursor mission to the Voyager. It was a great team of dedicated people, and one of them was Charlie Colhays, who was responsible for mission design during pre-launch and mission planning after the launch. A fan of science fiction adventure, Charlie was tasked with redesigning the entire mission as the Pioneer 1011 missions had discovered that Jupiter's radiation levels were much higher than previously thought. Also, Bud wanted Charlie to calculate trajectories for Voyager 2 to make a second pass at Saturn's moon Titan separately in case Voyager 1 failed, and if not, then to make sure that Voyager 2 continued to Uranus and Neptune. According to Charlie, we winnowed roughly 10,000 different launch date, arrival date possibilities down to 98 to cover the launch period, finally launching Voyager 2 on August 20th and Voyager 1 September 5th of 1977. That was the Goldilocks year for the launches, allowing us to have great encounters with Jupiter's Galilean moons, while also preserving the option to fly the grand tour onto Uranus and Neptune. Such a unique opportunity occurs every 176 years, so there won't be another chance until 2153. However, like any noble endeavor, Voyager had to confront many obstacles, hurdles, and challenges to reach the stars as well. The planets may have been aligning, but the government wasn't, at least at first. Based on Flandreau's report, NASA's original plan was to send as many as up to five probes to the four giant planets and Pluto, which has since then lost its status of being a planet. Obviously, this was a large request, a risky, adventurous, ambitious, and expensive task, so naturally, Congress turned it down. But it seems NASA knew what they were doing, because by demanding so much, they managed to settle for at least a two-spacecraft version of the endeavor that was then to be sent to just two planets. Congress approved it, and a phase two began, where NASA's engineers surreptitiously designed the spacecraft to withstand a longer journey, as if they knew they would be able to keep this mission alive as long as it were physically possible. They must have been hoping that if both spacecraft proved themselves as highly successful in yielding results, they might be able to convince NASA to extend the probe's itinerary to Uranus, Neptune, and probably beyond. 
According to the current project manager of Voyager, Suzanne Dodd, who joined the team as sequence science designer for Uranus and sequence integration engineer for Neptune, if an engineer had a choice to put in a part that was 10% more expensive but wasn't something that was needed for a four-year mission, they just went ahead and did that, and they wouldn't necessarily tell management. The job was to work with the science teams and help them design the observations they wanted to take during the encounter. Four of us were hired at the same time, and we shared a cubicle in a converted conference room on the fourth floor of Building 264 at the Jet Propulsion Lab. It wasn't the best office arrangement, but we didn't care. The work was very exciting. The veterans on the team had worked the Jupiter and Saturn encounters and told us stories of how exciting the encounter would be. It was a lot of work and long hours as we got closer to the flyby day, but no one minded it. It would be the first planetary encounter of Uranus, and we were making it happen. We were making history. This was a first-of-its-kind mission and entirely new territory for the engineers and scientists working on the project. In the early 1960s, NASA had attempted to send a series of spacecraft to the moon to survey future landing sites for crewed missions. After 12 failures, one such effort finally succeeded. So no one was highly optimistic, but they wanted to give their best. Before Voyagers, only one spacecraft had used a gravity assist to reach another planet. The Mariner 10 probe got one from Venus while en route to Mercury. Voyagers, on the other hand, were expected to do the same at least twice or four times. The calculation of gravity assist was the next challenge, and they couldn't afford margins of error larger than those measured in tens of minutes. The first stop for Voyagers, Jupiter, was about 10 times farther from Earth than Mercury. Another major challenge in front of the Voyager team was to help probes wade their way through the asteroid belt that lies in the large valley between Mars and Jupiter. This was a whole new challenge, and experts were wondering whether a spacecraft could get through the asteroid belt without being torn to pieces. Interestingly, this turned out to be a baseless fear very early in the project, as Pioneer 10 and 11 flew through the belt unscathed. The belt turned out to be mostly empty space, so Voyager could easily steer through it. However, the two spacecraft needed onboard intelligence to make sure nothing wrong would happen to these Volkswagen Beetle-sized vehicles. So NASA's engineers equipped the vehicle's computers with 69 kilobytes of memory. This is less than a hundred thousandth the capacity of a typical modern smartphone. In fact, this is less memory than the key fob that opens a car door. But back then it was a huge deal. And look how far these probes traveled with so little little while well, you're ogling at fake pictures on Instagram. Tisk tisk tisk. The next challenge for Voyager was to send and receive data from a distance that was never tried before. The spacecraft would collect all the data and store it on 8-track tape recorders before sending it back to Earth by a 23-watt transmitter. And they're doing the same process even now. The power level of this transmitter is roughly close to a refrigerator light bulb. To compensate for the weak transmitter, both Voyagers carry 12-foot wide dish antennas to send and receive signals. Alan Cummings, a physicist at Caltech and one of the original members of the Team Voyager, proudly exclaims that back then they felt as if they were right on top of the technology. He gleefully and excitingly remembers how proud the whole team was about how quickly they managed to build up the three spacecraft, including a full-scale functioning test model. Although many scientists have worked on the Voyagers over the decades, Cummings can make a unique claim. He said, I was the last person to touch the spacecraft before they launched. My next memorable moment was when Voyager 1 encountered Jupiter, the first planetary encounter for either Voyager. Since Ed was the project scientist, I sometimes got to occupy the CRS chair at the table where the scientists gathered to discuss what discoveries were going to be presented at the press conference the next morning. 
I remember seeing the image of the moon Io for the first time and thinking that Caltech students had engineered a brilliant stunt. They must have substituted a picture of a poorly made pizza for the picture of Io. All that orange and black on Io changed our thinking about the moons in the solar system. I think most of us thought they would all look more or less like our own moon. But wow, how wrong was that? The discussion at the table about whether we were looking at an old or a new surface was fascinating and was put to rest a few days later with the stunning discovery of the volcanoes erupting in real time on Io. Tell us in the comments if you have a special fact about Voyager to share. And as always, thanks for watching Factnominal. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe, and ring the bell for more amazing videos like this.